Our next block of talks uh, relates specifically to the elbow, so we're moving from a, a general session to a much more specific session. Uh, we have four speakers for you, and again, some time for discussion at the end. Our first speaker is uh, is present here and uh, alive, and then the other three are all remote. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker, uh, Ingo File, who is uh, going to talk on a new view on elbow dysplasia. So uh, welcome to Ingo. Thank you. OK. Thank you for your invitation to be here. It's nice that you were coming here. OK, thank you. Uh, I want to give you a new view on uh, ED. Why that? I think uh, there are a lot of problems. And, uh, if you have questions, that's all right. And I had them too. OK. Now, I want to do two hypotheses. One is, do you think that dogs like pain? Who? No. OK. Who thinks that they are avoiding pain? Please, hands up. Hands up. How much do they avoid in pain? Uh, please, come on. Coffee doesn't. Uh, I think the majority says, OK, they don't like pain. Now, Anna, please come in front. Please, Anna. Ah, I need one thing. Please come up. Please, the camera's on the foot. Please, I want that you are walking like Charlie Chaplin, like that, OK? And now you go from the one monitor, like more and more external rotated, OK? And now backward. Do you like it? No. no. OK, they don't like it. That is the th second hypothesis on this. I, th I think the dogs don't like to have, if they have a malformation. Anna, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, that the dogs don't like to have the paw somewhere but in the direction where they walk. Okay, as we do. So, now I think the most important study which has been done is that from Danielson, that's on uh, Noel Fitzpatrick. Uh, they showed that it's a chronic fragmentation of the coronate and that the uh, medial, medial part of the, of the elbow is overloaded over time. That means it is a mechanical problem. So, now that means, at the other hand, we have to look at the movement of the dog. What is happening? Now, movement of the dog, most of the people are forgetting the muscles. Then we have, in the stance phase, triceps and biceps are active. Now, if we are looking at triceps, this one, he's not, a hyper, he's not extending. He don't allow the elbow that he collapses, and it is an angulated, angulated limb. And when the gravity comes down, then some force uh, have to counteract the gravity, so the dog keeps this 135 degree of angulation. Okay, but then he is avoiding the elbow collapse, and he has an anti-flexor function. The next one is biceps. Biceps is getting acting during whole stance phase hold stance phase, and at the end of the stance phase, he, begins, he becomes very, very powerful. Okay, that's one thing. Now, we have to think about the biceps function, and I apologize, I, uh, in uh, my former thinking, I never included him. I ignored him, sorry biceps for that. Now we have to look on the, on the origin. He comes from the supraclinoid, from the scapula, and goes cranially with two tenons at the ulna and the radius. Okay, that creates a force which pulls both together to the humerus. Very, very clear. And he is responsible for homogeneous force distribution in the whole elbow. It's not one point. It's the whole elbow. And if you look at the joint surface, the ulnar notch is the biggest joint surface we have. It is not the radius, it is not the coronate, it's the ulnar notch. And, but we don't have to separate them. We have to look at them at uh, both together. And then also we have the biggest bone proximal of the antebrachium in the elbow is the ulna. It's a very, very big bone. Why is, it, why is there a big bone? He has to take a lot of pressure. Okay, 
I think nature is thinking they're good. But then we're coming to Stan's face and then we have the flexors. And now the flexors, they are, you have to think, in a trot, uh, eight up to tenfold body weight the dog is having on his paw. A tenfold. We know that from, from, from plate force analysis. Now, when they are contacting that, then we are extending the tendons. Extending the tendons. And that must be forces. There, you know, my, na my name is Pfeil. And you know, in English, it's arrow. And I'm shooting arrow. I take the tendon, put it back, okay? And then, chop, just by releasing this force, the arrow is flying, okay? Now, and the problem is they have no activity. They have no activity. But they have force inside by tension. Now, at, and at the moment of jumping, when he's jumping off, that's fantastic. It's fantastic. The, there is no muscle active. No muscle, but they're jumping off. It's the releasing the force of the hyperextended flexors. Uh, carpi ulnas, carpi radialis, uh, the digital uh, uh, flexors. Now, we see that, and I thank you for Martin, who gave me that. This is a dog who walks. I hope you see it. And you see now the muscles which are getting active. And you see, now he, he comes, uh, uh, oh no, we have to do it there. <laughs> Sorry. The limb comes now in front, okay? That paw gets to the bottom. Triceps is active, okay? Then biceps is active. And the moment of, oh, stop, stop. Doesn't stop, doesn't like me, okay? One moment. He's walking a bit more. There's no muscle active anymore. It's white. It's white. But the paw is going off. That means at this time, a lot of force is only by the tendons got into the dog for jumping off. Oh, I love it. It's so economically. It's, uh, uh, it, they don't need force to get off of the, of the button. But then we have to think also of the tendons. Not only about muscle forces, also of the tendons. Like they do. Okay. Now... This one. That's a chihuahua. He helps me also a, uh, a lot. Uh, I watched that video, I think, about 1,000 times. Yeah. What you see is that at the moment when he touched the ground, the humerus is getting fixed in the, in, in the elbow. It is small. There's a short moment when he touches it, it gets together. And we can also see that. One moment. Oop. When it's here, you have a white appearance here as it is loose. And the moment of the stance face, it is disappeared. White means there is uh, cartilage and fluid, no bone. But then in the stance face, it's gone. Okay, they are pulled together. The tendons and the flexors are doing the job to pull the elbow together. Now, I hope this functions. I have Balu. Balu Balu. Uh, that is a dog who opens a bit my mind. Now, if you see, he's walking. The video is from the owner, and you have a severe lameness at the left side. Now, when we look, one moment. We st stop it. Now, look at the paw. In the swinging phase, the paw is external. You see that it's external rotated. It's external rotated. But in the moment, He touched the ground, it's in direction where he walks. But then when you see what is happening, shoulders inside, elbow outside, pores inside. That means you have a bow-legged limb. Then you have pressure on the medial side. Okay? Now, 
That is Balo here, the sclerosis, all that would be known, the coronate, we put them out, okay. Then there is, there is a second point. A second point, what we say, elbow has supination pronation. Supination pronation, okay. Then uh, when we have in a flexed position, in a flexed position, you see we have uh, around about 80 degree, you can make supination pronation. But when the pore is hyperextended, the tendons are stretched They're there, the tendons are pulling the humerus together to the, uh, to the uh, ulnar notch and the anconeo fix is fixed, then you see that. It's around about five degree and it's more in the digits. It's more in the digits. We have no movement in the elbow, we have nearly nothing in the corpus, okay, only in the digits. And so we have to think, why can he compensate that? He can compensate that as he is doing that in the shoulder, in the shoulder. And corrections, torsion about 50 to 80 degree, and the result is bow-legged limp, and then he is uh, overloading medial side. That makes me think that that might be one reason of elbow dysplasia. Now, then I did one thing, the, the surgeries I do is uh, the double oblique ulnar osteotomy and we compared the distal ulnar osteotomy, Paul and Bird. Double oblique ulnar osteotomy corrects external torsion of the underbrachium. Distal ulnar osteotomy uh, does correct external torsion of the underbrachium. Paul corrects external torsion of the underbrachium. Burp corrects external torsion of the underbrachium, but not so much, but it is uh, published that they are improving. So, uh, I kind of judge Q, I kind of judge SHO, as I don't do that. Okay. Now, there one, only one example, that is a distal uh, ulnar ostectomy I did, a uh, six months old dog. Um, you, we see here, then we have in the sagittal line, you see that the pore is external out of the sagittal plane, then we did that. And then after the surgery, we found that pore is directed cranially, okay? And that every of those surgeries does. Paul does it, double oblique does that. And so, the next question to me was then, uh, why are there still progressing arthrosis? Now, the problem of this is double oblique, Paul and Burp, they are, uh, they are correcting the external torsion by back shifting of the ulna. Then the, the humerus rotate backwards and the paw is coming, and coming inside. And uh, the only one who doesn't do that is the distal ulnar ostectomy. I've not seen it in the ulnar ostectomy. And Aldo presented that, that the sclerosis is diminished by that. That means it's a very, very good method uh, up to five, six months. You can do that. And now look at this Rottweiler. This Rottweiler, we did a double oblique uh, on osteotomy. I don't know if, yeah, you can see it. It is here. Then two months later, healing was very young, okay. One year later, I got an x-ray from another clinic, and you saw that there is a big osteophyte there. That comes as the humerus is rotating and he's stressing the cranial, cranial part of the radius. Then they are growing osteophytes, okay? But the dog was good, he was limb free instead of his osteophyte. We don't have to treat x-ray uh, picture, we have to treat dogs. The thing is, now I have another finding which is very uncommon and I think not mentioned is Old English Bulldog, three years, had pain in shoulder and elbow. Okay, pain in shoulder and elbow. Now, when I looked in the, and we scope every time, shoulder and elbow, every time. Uh, without when I have no time, yes, but sometimes it, it is like that. But uh, I think in 80, 90%, I'm always scoping the shoulder. And you see here a chronic biceps tendinitis, 
and we see a very, very fresh, three years old English Bulldog fractured coronet. Okay? Why is that? Now, he has pain. When you, if anyone has shoulder problems, you know you can't lift up your hand anymore. Yes? They are avoiding to use the biceps very, they have pain. They have pain. They don't want to use the biceps. And then at the end of the stance phase, the angle gets uh, more, nearly to 100 degree, and the lever arm is getting bigger. Therefore, the biceps has to bring power to keep the elbow together. Now, another dog. This is a flat coat retriever, six years old. He had a zero degree external torsion of the antebrachium. No incongruency in the elbow. Chronic inflammation of the biceps tendon. And he had a fissure line here. Okay? And we have, the, those cases are more rare. They are not as often as the external torsion, but they play a role. But it, they are telling me. This whole thing, can, we only can look at the elbow in, uh, in the whole limb conformation. And uh, we need a sagittal plane for movement to get like a, a wolf or a greyhound. They are mostly very, very straight. I already mentioned this. We go to that. Okay, then now question. Uh, treatment, is there a simpler treatment. And we had the, the distal ulnar ostectomy is, has a low morbidity. You know, distal ulna, low morbidity, middle shaft ulna, you have a metal pain, and uh, in the upper ulna you have more pain as triceps has so much forces. Okay. Now, then we thought, okay, can we correct that in the distal part of the ulna? So here you see uh, the line this line is elbow to the paw. Paw is external, uh, has an external torsion. It's the external torsion of the underbrahim. It's not rotated. Then we cut the ulnar distal, make a plate. We fix that with a plate, and then you see this gets in direction of movement. Okay? So then we said we did that on Kondera uh, a few times. Then we said, okay, uh, let's try that. And... Uh, we call it the distal abduction osteotomy, doll and Paul, you know, Paul, Paul and Dole. Oh, okay. And the theoretical indication in my thinking is the apophysis has to be enclosed. External torsion of the antebrachium, the indication is 30 to 9 degree. Uh, they must have elbow pain, all those signs of uh, uh, scler sclerotic ulna, etc., etc. And the mechanic, mechanic medial humeral antebrachium angle has not been lower than 79, 80, we don't know it. But it's, uh, you know, over time when they have overloading, they, uh, they erodate the cartilage and afterwards they are erodating the, the bone. Then it gets medial collapsed and if you make the torsion, you still have the medial collapse. It makes no sense. You need a gap like, like on Paul to correct that. To, to shift up, to correct that. Then you need paw. Now, and uh, it has to be, I think, a lower than an outer bridge four. That's my theoretical. Uh, we don't know. We have uh, a few cases up to now. We have 18 cases. You see all those breeds, uh, it's, and with a mean age of 3.8 years, more younger dogs, body weight was 32 kilogram, 11 male and 7 female. No one is wondering about that. But now we look at the torsion angle, pre-up, they had uh, sometimes up to 85 degree, but the mean was 60 degree, 60 degree of external torsion. Post-op, there was around about 10 degree, but we had also some which were 25. Healing time was very fast, like on our ostectomy. And uh, we had FCP with intact cartilage, nine, FCP outer bridge, one to three, four, medial compartment three, medial compartment four, we had also three. Now, we see the radiological healing, that is one we cut there, post-op, after eight weeks you nearly see nothing, it's healed, perhaps a bit, but it's okay. Now we look at complications. The problem of the ulna in the distal part is very, very near to the radius and it's curved. And when I used bicortical screws, uh, I sometimes touched the radius and that was pain. That was pain. That definitely means we 
need monocortical screws. And then you see the results, the blue one, create four laminas and three laminas. That is what we normally see after four weeks. That's the orange one. They improve amazingly. Four weeks. That was good. Yes, but they improved more. Then they get to the gray one was eight weeks. And then I have only six cases, uh, about 12 weeks uh, out of those 18 cases. But they were all improving and they the owners were happy. They were really happy after four weeks. Okay. Now, I'll show you just one Rottweiler. Uh, he had an intact cartilage stored on the right side. That's after four weeks. He had a grade one lamnus on the right side. We did the right side. And uh, pore is relatively straight. And if we go a bit back, it's hard to see as I'm not in the surgical plane of the, of, the, of the dog, but it's bowed here. It's bowed here. Now for the plate, we use the, the Kion Alps Blade 8, uh, but it's not so perfect, so we were thinking to make a new blade uh, to be monocortical fixed. That is what, we, uh, what Steve designed now. It corrects the angle here nicely and now, I'm thinking of sources of ED. I think ED, the elbow itself, definitely has a short radius, short ulna, one source. Okay. Then external torsion of the antebrachium is the second one for me. It's compensation of the shoulder. And what we did, we did a thesis in the, um, I th think it was 98, about anesthesia in the joints. So we scoped all those joints. And in this time, always I was finding that if you have an elbow problem, that the medial side of the tendon had a slight inflammation. And I couldn't explain. And I think as uh, the, the, they also want to avoid pain, uh, in the distal part, they are not so active with the biceps, and then the, the humerus is getting uh, rotating. And then the longest part of the tenon is on the medial side, and might be is overextended. I don't know that. It's just my thinking. Might be I'm right. I don't know. And then we have also to think about biceps. Uh, pathologies uh, about a pain-avoiding mechanism. <clears throat> So I come to my way to treat ED. At, at the moment, I'm very encouraged to do more dolls, uh, as the results are very good. I like it. Up to six mon uh, months, I do distal ulna ostectomy plus arthroscopy. Six to ten months, I do, still do the double oblique and arthroscopy. Ten months, and now you can't say any time. It's uh, two out of bridge three. I do a doll and arthroscopy. If they have outer bridge four and the bone is looking at you and you are looking at the bone and you are thinking about to have the dog, you do Paul arthroscopy. And when they are very, very bad, we are combining that by controlling stem cells. It's not the, uh, we, it's a bionic therapy and uh, those are getting fibrous cartilage back, which is, uh, it's another topic. In all cases, we scope shoulder if I have time. If biceps is the source, I mostly treat the biceps, but I look also for, for the external torsion. If they have an external torsion, I'm correcting it, okay? But I think about 80% uh, of them, I treat only them arthroscopically. Now, the conclusion is the elbow is the little asshole of the front limb. He gets every load. <laughs> and if you, if you have, a, uh, I spoke to a surgeon from Gießen. He said, now if you have a forelimb lamnus, elbow. If you have forelimb lamnus, elbow. Now, the elbow is only the, sm this is the smallest part in, in the whole front limb. There are also pathologies on other things, but this is the weakest point. If you're in, only in mechanics, I believe in Isaac Newton, uh, if you have a bowed pin, then the most stress factor is in the mid. That is the elbow. In the hind limb, we have patellar relaxation. You know, external torsion of the femur creates medial patellar relaxation. Vargas of the femur creates medial patellar relaxation. Vargas of the, the tibia uh, creates uh, patellar relaxation. Medial, 
and external torsion of the pore too. And at the other one, lateral. Now, why it shouldn't be like elbow? The problem on all that is we only can judge that in the stance phase. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and finish right on time, which, which we all appreciate. Um, and that's a conclusion that nobody's going to forget, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, a five-minute changeover, so potentially we've got time for one, one or two questions. Anybody have a question for, uh, for Ingo? Okay, well... Okay. I guess not. No remote questions? No. Uh, to our remote viewers, welcome back. Please don't hesitate to uh, drop us questions. Thank you very much for an extremely entertaining talk. And uh, please join us at the end up here for, um, for okay. the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, after that uh, very comprehensive review, uh, we'll now move into the next, uh, the next three talks, all remote, as I mentioned. Uh, I'll are more specific. The, the next talk is uh, entitled YQ, and um, I don't know the answer, so I'm looking forward to that. And our speaker, as I mentioned remotely, uh, is uh, Peter Butcher, and I hope I pronounced that name somewhat right, but it's very difficult for a British person to say your surname. Um, and Peter's coming from the Freie Universität in Berlin. So um, welcome. I can see you on the screen now, Peter, so I will hand over to you and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Uh, thank you very much for Ingo uh, opening the floor with this very interesting ideas about uh, biomechanics of the front limb. Uh, I have a much easier topic uh, because I just can um, um, yeah, document and report on our experience uh, using the Q system in uh, end stage elbows. So we are talking about uh, grade four to uh, five outer bridge um, elbows. And the big question is very similar to what uh, Ingo was asking, what is the problem? It's the problem that those dogs feel pain in their uh, osteoarthritic elbows. It's not about mechanics. Uh, all those uh, osteophytes, fibrotic changes, reduction in range of motion, and I mean, all the other pathologies which are present um, all around and within the elbow are not the real problem. We are facing pain. So if there would be a pill which would eliminate pain right away without any side effect, we will probably never have to do surgery anymore, at least not in the elbow. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not available. So um, we have to treat pain. And it's the, the question, what is the source of this pain? What is the main source? And how could we approach this surgically? So this is a case of Bernadette. Um, and this is a dog with a bilateral end stage elbow arthritis, so bone and bone. And I think it's easy to appreciate that this dog is not happy. This dog tries to unload the front limbs, tries to walk more on the hind limbs. Uh, you see that the dog is in pain, um, is breathing heavily. So this dog would prefer to lie down and not to walk. And on the right side, you see the dog a few minutes later, maybe 15 or 20 minutes later, having an um, uh, intra-articular joint injection with an anesthetic. Um, and this dog is now freely moving, um, being happy, uh, very active. So if any type of surgery would result in this effect, we would be very happy. And I think we would probably agree that we have found a very good uh, technique uh, to help those dogs. So it's about pain. This dog has the same osteophytes, the same limitation in range of motion, the same inflammation, everything is the same, but we just eliminated um, pain. And this is why this dog is now so happy. So the question is, how could we do this um, surgically? And so I'm a very strong believer that, and this has been shown in multiple studies, I mean, we, we know that we have different sources of pain in the osteoarthritic joint, but once we have overt bone lesions, so outer bridge four or even five, like in that picture where you see the grinding of the subchondral bone into each other, uh, we, have, we have pain primarily coming from the subchondral bone. So the, 
the, the mechanical conflict between bone and bone during motion, during stance phase, the pressure and the sliding motion uh, from subchondral bone to subchondral bone is the main source. It doesn't mean that's the only source, but it's the main source at that stage of the disease. And uh, the, the, the mechanics are stimulating the subchondral bone um, mechanically and thermal. Um, and in addition to this, of course, we have a chemical irritation. Uh, the subchondral bone is sensitive, so all the uh, inflammatory uh, enzymes can attack the subchondral bone and stimulate uh, the bone um, chemically and mechanically. And so the idea of the Q implantation and any other resurfacing, I mean, it's nothing else than a resurfacing procedure like we do in the hip. I mean, we have a bad hip. We are not treating inflammation. We are not treating soft tissue disease. We are just removing bone and bone and put in new surfaces. And usually that results in a very good, even normal function. So the idea is eliminate bone and bone by putting in synthetic surfaces. And you should, at least theoretically, you should be fine. And so the Q implantation or the Q system uh, aims in, at this effect. So we implant a small plastic pack into the coronoid, which is not covering the whole diseased area. So this is a partial resurfacing procedure that's important. And of course, it would be a better way um, to resurface all the diseased area, everything which is denuded, new surface, fine. The problem is more a technical one. Yeah? So you would probably need kind of a custom-made implant or then like the coin prosthesis or the tape prosthesis, more a kind of a hemi or total joint prosthesis. But this one was designed to be minimal in terms of minimal bone stock removal, small implants, but hopefully having the same effect as a large resurfacing procedure. And to achieve this, to get more mechanical release than just by those small areas of resurfacing, one of the uh, at the ulna and a bit of larger uh, one at the humerus, the humeral implant is designed that it's not flush all around. So someone not familiar with the Q implantation would probably say, oh, this is not a good uh, implantation because we have the implant proud here. It's sticking out of the surface. There's something wrong. You should have implanted it more deeply so that it's really flush all around. If we would do this, we would have resurfaced only that area. And if the metallic implant comes into contact with the plastic implant, fine. Now we have eliminate bone and bone in this specific situation. But with the design feature of having this implant sticking out slightly, I mean, we are talking about half a millimeter, maybe a millimeter, we are inducing a wedge effect in the medial compartment. So it's not just putting in some synthetic in the diseased areas. It's in addition to this, opening up, lifting up the humeral condyle by maybe half a millimeter, a millimeter, and by doing so, we will have at least reduced contact, maybe even no contact, even around the implant. So we eliminate bone and bone in a larger area than we resurface with those two little implants. So that's the idea. And that the second effect is working, at least in general, in many of those dogs. Uh, we can prove this by second look showing that we have fibrocartilage forming around those implants, which means that those surfaces being denuded before the implantation have less pressure, less mechanical conflict after the implantation due to this wedge effect. So this is the idea. And uh, when uh, Jimmy Cook and um, um, Kurt Schultz uh, started this project, they tried to formulate their, their goals to um, design this kind of new implant. And so the idea was uh, to come up with a new technique, with a new implant, which is safe and has good uh, efficacy in terms of resolution of clinical symptoms. Uh, so their goal was uh, to treat those dogs so that they are able to return to their previous level of function. So a hunting dog could be back um, I could be uh, go back to to hunting uh, as uh, previously before the uh, pain was too severe. 
So these are the implants, as I already mentioned. So you have a cobalt chromium implant on the humerus, and you have a plastic implant, a polyethylene implant at the ulna. Um, so the previous version, the, the generation one, was without the titanium socket. So nowadays we have a titanium socket on both implants, So which assures a good um, integrity and stability of the implants in the um, uh, in the uh, in the bone. And uh, apparently, based on our experience and what has been told by other users, we have not uh, problems of loosening of those implants, even though it has been reported in a few cases for sure. The implantation is based on the actual anatomy, so we are not trying to to uh, make something new based on a uh, chart or basic based on a, a theoretical diagram of the of the joint, and we are accepting the the current anatomical deformation which are present, um, which makes it relatively easy because we are just following the present anatomical curvatures, and to be as precise as possible, uh, we have a few jigs, so it's very similar to implanting a synocard implant which means that we have a jig, a tube, which helps us to align the guide pin perpendicular to the joint surface where we decided to place in the ulnar implant. Then we have a reamer, which just follows the guide pin, um, controls for death and everything, so we do not have to think about uh, this. It's, it's just the challenge to put in the guide pin at the right position in the right angle. So this is kind of the challenge for the surgeon. Once we have this, we can put in the implant and we are fine. And the same procedure applies to the humerus, uh, just with the difference that we apply two parallel pins uh, because we have this, what we call the snowman implant. So this larger implant to overlying a uh, circus at the humeral um, trochlea. But basically it's the same that we have to put in those pins perpendicular to the joint surface, to the actual joint surface. And we have this, this kind of chick uh, to help us to guide this uh, position in an angulation, we ream it out once again with a dedicated reamer which controls for depth, and then we put in the implant. And as I said, the result should be that we are flush cranially and caudally, so we do not want to have a step def effect there, otherwise we would grind into the opposing joint surface. But at the center, the implant has another shape, it's not matching the curvature of the condyle, uh, per definition, to act as this wedge that I was talking about. So what do we know about clinical outcomes? So there are now two studies out there. The first study was done by the inventors and a big group of other surgeons using this implant. So it was kind of the, the first experience using this implant. Most of the cases were done uh, in in US, but there were a few uh, European cases included too. So more than 100 cases with at least a follow-up of six months. And the function was judged uh, based on this uh, three categories as it has been described. So full function, acceptable function, and unacceptable function. And interestingly, uh, if you combine full and acceptable function, you have a good to full functional outcome of 90% and a little bit more. Um, but on the uh, same uh, side, it's important to have a, what we would call a safe technique. It's not just about the outcome, it's also about um, what can be, um, what, what problems uh, can we face. And so the rate of complication was still relatively high. Um, the inventors would probably have hoped for a smaller number of um, catastrophic and major complication. But interestingly, when we analyze this and we look back, a lot, a lot of those complications were not attributed to the implants and the Q procedure per se. Uh, we had great problems with the approach because at that time uh, we approached the medial compartment of the elbow joint with a osteotomy of the medial epicondyle, and uh, that was quite complicated. I can say I have done a good number, and this was always the most complicated part of the surgery to approach the joint to do a good osteotomy and then to reattach it um, safely. And so with the approach, we had most of the problems compared to the implantation itself. So these are uh, results that Jimmy Cook is sharing. 
So one dog, the, the shepherd dog, having a bilateral cue, I know that it's always very hard to judge on a bilaterally treated case. But if you look at this uh, black Labrador preoperatively having a, I mean, obvious lameness and postoperatively se seven months post-op, not being completely free of lameness. So I would not call this a full functional outcome, but I would be pretty happy if all my of my dogs would be like this. And um, so uh, I would call this a very good functional outcome, even though the dog shows still some residual lameness, which is and might be attributed to some residual pain or might be part of some mechanical lameness, stiffness, and so on. But as I said, if we would anesthetize this dog, probably as so an intraarticulary, probably we might not see any lameness anymore. So most of the time we should think lameness equals pain and not think, ah, this is all mechanical. This is probably more something for us uh, to feel better if we are not able to resolve the problem completely. So when we look at our cases, so recently we, we looked back at our cases in four different um, centers in Europe. So altogether we had 50 cases about, so half of what had been published previously. But the significant difference is that we used another approach. So um, Kurt Rundleberg was describing a caudal medial approach to the elbow, and I think um, it's the same approach that, uh, which is used for the uh, Cayenne prosthesis also. And so we adapted this and we uh, started using this for the Q uh, because we felt that the approach was one of the major limitations of that procedure. And so we just look back to 52 cases being done, being performed using this new uh, caudal medial approach. And we judge those, um, uh, those dogs the same way, the same categories, full acceptable and unacceptable. And you see that we have in, in when you sum them up, uh, almost 90% of good to full function, but the ratio is different. So we, we didn't see this almost 50% of full function. We, see, we saw more dogs having acceptable function, which means significant improvement, but still residual visual lameness. And only a quarter of our cases that we treated had visually no problems at all, were completely function. Um, no lameness, even not other have heavy F exercise. So my explanation for this obvious difference in, in ratio of full to acceptable function is more based on how we put them in the categories, because as I showed you the picture of this black Labrador, um, this is what I would not call full function, but maybe other people would call this full function between that, because this Labrador uh, could be back uh, on a hunt. And if this is the, the outcome measure, so the dog is being able to go back on a hunt, and uh, this is full function, um, of course, you might put them in different categories. But what is even more important is that we had more major complication. We had no catastrophic complication, which is nice. So no arthrodesis, amputation, euthanasia, whatever, due to the procedure. But we had almost double major complication, even though we hope to improve this by changing the approach. And most of those complications are not related to the approach. So the idea of changing the approach was a good idea because we eliminated the minor problems associated with this. But a significant number, what we consider to be a major complication, were dogs which had persistent lameness or didn't improve the way that we were expecting. And in some of those cases, we had the chance to do a second look arthroscopy and saw, saw some mechanical conflict. So this is a case where you see this, um, you, you see within the joint a, a, a line, um, even going through the implant. And on the right side, so you an arthroscopic picture of another dog having the implant in front of you. So we're sitting immediately on the plastic implant and the, the hook is pointing to this impingement grinding line. So this is a mechanical conflict of the metallic implant onto the owner. And the reason why this might happen in some of these dogs is that probably the edges due to this wedge effect, so the sticking out of the implant and the relatively sharp edges of the implant might lead to this impingement if you have some slight malangulation, so mediolateral malangulation of the implants, which is very, very hard to control. And so... The, the way that we um, 
solve this, or we will and hope to solve this, is by redesigning the implant instead of having an implant being proud. We need this wedge, wedge effect. We will have an implant which is still proud, but which is round, even medially and laterally, just to allow for some malangulation. And this is the, the new implant, uh, which we started to use in the pilot project to check for this for the potential benefit uh, of this implant. So the biggest limitation in my mind is that there seems to be in a few dogs, in, in specific cases, um, a potential problem of mechanical conflict of this proud implant at the trochlea. And by redesigning that implant and otherwise almost not changing the procedure uh, at all, so only very minor uh, technical um, differences, um, I'm quite sure that we will improve this um, significantly and therefore reduce a potential source of yeah, bad functional outcome, which would be very hard to correct for. This is uh, for sure um, important to know once you face this challenge and you have a dog like this. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not easy just to pull out the humeral implant and to repositioning uh, something like this. So this is why it's extremely important that we better understand that uh, parameter and hopefully solve it uh, with the new design uh, humeral implant. So why a Q? Uh, because it aims at the basic principle of pain, bone and bone. It eliminates effectively bone and bone with small implants. So even if in a very bad case where we would have to remove some of those implants, um, uh, we have still bone stock. We can still think about a grafting procedure or a custom-made implant or even a total joint implant as a rescue procedure. But uh, we will not have to think about fusion or amputation as a yeah, plan B in the very bad cases, which are very, very unfrequent, luckily. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, a very interesting talk. Uh, we are more or less back up to time, so I think I'm going to ask anybody in the room or online to hold questions for the discussion at the end. And if you could stay around um, for discussions, Peter, that would be that would be fantastic. So uh, from Germany, we're moving now to Italy, and the first of three presentations from three different surgeons at uh, Clinica Vizzoni. Um, this next one is uh, following up on YQ. The next one is Y Paul. And uh, next speaker is Silvia Boyocci from, as I say, from Clinica Vezzoni. So I will hand over to Silvia and uh, thank you very much. Thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, just one second, because I do not see my presentation on the internet clicker. I see the presentation of Peter. Just one second. Okay, I think I'm fine. So I want to thank uh, Kieran for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to speak about Paul. We suggest Paul as a treatment option for media compartment disease in symptomatic adult dogs as a palliative treatment when conservative management is not satisfactory. Medial compartment disease is the end result of an incongruent elbow, and that causes a vicious cycle that is composed by collapse of the medial joint compartment, limb abduction, increased medial load, medial shift of the body weight, and in such a scenario, any joint treatment is, is unrewarding. And looking at this arthroscopic image, it is a typical scenario we see when we treat cases with Paul. The thing that we can notice is that we have a net demarcation between the lateral side of the joint, in which the normal cartilage is still present, and the medial side of the joint, where we can see the bone completely exposed. And this net demarcation points out the attention that probably the cause of this condition, as was already mentioned this morning, it's a mechanical problem. 
And so the aim of the surgical technique is to shift the body weight, the body weight, the body weight from medial to the lateral compartment of the elbow. And we can do that with two types of osteotomies nowadays, using SHO or using the pole technique. This paper already established that SHO can cause a, an alteration, a significant alteration in the frontal plane thoracic limb alignment. And recently, a same similar study was done regarding the pole technique. So they used the standing weight, standing weight bearing radiograph as proposed by Goodrich in veterinary surgery of 2014, where they measured the mechanical axis of the full limb before and after pole, and they look at deviation of mechanical axis. And the thing that uh, they found was that the pole technique, mainly the three millimeter step pole technique, reducing, reducing the mechanical axis deviation, mainly um, moving the mechanical axis from medial to the lateral side of the joint. And another interesting result of this paper was that they proved what we want to see in clinical cases, that is the lateral deviation of the foot when the dog is weight bearing. And actually, this is what we want to see. Uh, so, so that the video works, I'm happy about that. What, what we want to see in clinical cases, on the left, we have a dog that is limping, and on the right is the same dog, just one month post-op, in which we did a full three millimeter step. And the thing that we can notice that is the dog, is the, the limb of the dog that is abducting. So that's another paper, an older one. Uh, they did a different type of, the, of study, again, an ex vivo paper. They look at the change in content elbow pressure. And the thing they found out was that pole uh, may ameliorate, may increase the medial compartment pressure in the incongruent elbow, but it does not uh, cause any increase in the lateral contact area. So the question is why my choice is for pole is because elbow replacement is not still yet widely used because in case of failure, it will end up in severe complications. And if needed, total elbow replacement or partial elbow replacement can be performed later on. Pole, as all other surgical procedures right now are available right now are palliative, but we think that pole is the less invasive with less and more easily affordable risk of complications. So this is our case selection. We perform poll in adult dogs. Since 12 to 15 months of age, usually we stop at eight, not more than nine years of age, because of the severity of the medial compartment disease of in these older dogs, with lameness that is caused by medial compartment disease. And that lameness is unresponsive to conservative or previous arthroscopic treatment. We perform arthroscopy in every case to evaluate the lateral compartment to perform the joint treatment, but mainly for giving a more precise prognosis to the owners. For example, in that German Shepherd dog, a young dog, 1.5 years of age, we see medial compartment disease, but still some spots of fibrocartilage on the medial side. And that older dog, that Rottweiler, four years of age, the condition is more severe. In fact, if we look at the green arrow, that is pointing the medial side of the radial head, in which we see that the cartilage is not present anymore in that area. And that uh, can allow us to tell the, the owner that the prognosis will be more reserved. That's a case in which Paul is not indicated for us. Uh, that dog underwent uh, in another clinic previous joint infiltrations, and we thought that they ended up with um, ended up in uh, joint septic arthri arthritis with erosion on, of the lateral compartment of the joint. So that dog is not a candidate for us. That's another scenario in which we do not suggest Paul. Um, cases of an united anconeal process uh, associated with medial compartment disease, as in that dog. But looking at the last two image on the right, this refers to the lateral compartment of the joint. We do not think that that uh, joint is in a good uh, condition for a pole technique. That's another another case. Um, let's say they are, these are not common. They are coming more common nowadays in our caseload. Younger, older dogs, more than 12 months of age, with only medial coronoid disease. As you can see in the arthroscopic image, 
you can see the fissure line in the medial coronoid without any other um, joint cartilage involvement in the medial side of, of the joint. And we treat these cases only with joint treatment, subtotal coronoidectomy, but we suggest further rechecks in case Paul is needed, we can perform that later on. And that an, is another contraindication for us, severely affected uh, cases with end-stage osteoarthritis. That is not only the end-stage of osteoarthritis that worried us, that is the reduced range of motion of these elbows. So we do not think that Paul can do a good job in such, um, such severe cases. So this is our case load in 11 years of experience. We treated 135 elbows in 125 dogs. The interesting part is that uh, almost half of our cases have a long-term follow-up from one year to up to five years. And we look at the outcome, looking at lameness. We ask owner to fulfill a questionnaire, the load questionnaire. When possible, we suggest uh, we, we do a gait analysis before and after pull. We look at the X-rays for OA scoring. We report, of course, of course, complications. And when possible, we suggest a second look arthroscopy. So in this graph, the thing that we can notice is the clinical lame, the, the lameness before and after pull technique. For example, looking at the, the green line that refers before pull, almost 80% of the dog were presented with a grade 2 lameness and after poll only 8% of them were in this in, uh, in this class and looking at the majority of the cases they went to grade 1 or grade 0 and at one year follow up the thing that we can notice is a further improvement in uh, clinical uh, clinical signs this graph refers to the uh, load questionnaire results Again, the, the blue line is before poll. As you can see, almost half of the owners reported scores greater than 20. And the greater than 20 means that dog's, be, dog's behavior was severely affected by osteoarthritis. And the interesting point again is that uh, only 10% of them after poll have a, such a great score. As I said, when possible, we use the MAT, so an objective evaluation of uh, the lameness of these dogs uh, to, to evaluate objectively the results of our technique. So in that, that is a recent case. It's a young dog, 1.5 years of age. In fact, if you look at the arthroscopic image, the medial compartment is affected, but still some spots of fibrocartilage are present. This dog had um, a left uh, front limb lameness uh, with a score of 88. And that's the follow-up uh, 1.5 years later. And the interesting thing uh, is that the scores uh, were equal between uh, front and hind limb. That means an improvement of um, clinical signs. Regarding uh, radiographic assessment, the thing that we look at, of course, is bone union. And the majority of our cases uh, underwent complete bone union uh, near three months after post-op. And the interesting part, again, is that with the new implants, uh, with the pole 2 uh, implants that provide a much stronger fixation, the thing that we notice is that even older old dogs, uh, for example, this golden retriever, eight years of age, have um, a complete union at two months in the postoperative period. At, uh, during the radiographic evaluation, we look also at the OA progression, mainly in the follow-ups. Uh, we can compare in these images the operative view and the two years follow-up of this golden retriever treated with Paul. And the thing we notice is that the, in this case, uh, the OA was not progressed, but the thing that we had as a result is that we found minimal to minimal progression of osteoarthritis in the long term after pole technique. As I said, when possible, uh, we suggest a second look arthroscopy. Um, in this specific case, a German Shepherd, we suggest plate removal because we suspected a low-grade infection. So in the same surgical session, we do the second look arthroscopy and we remove the plate. And these are the two images in comparison. I hope the video is going well, but the dog is, uh, is not limping. That's why the video, the video is here. But the interesting part again are the arthroscopic image. Uh, we see 
uh, fiber cartilage formation where the fiber where the cartilage was not present before uh, the pole technique, and that is an encouraging an encouraging finding. Regarding our complication rate, we had ten major complications. It means uh, seventy point four percent of complication. Uh, two of uh, these ten cases uh, were uh, we had plate breakage. To be honest, these were the first cases we treated. In fact, we used the prototype plate, so that will not happen anymore. And again, regarding the other eight uh, complications, mainly the stress shielding is something we will not face anymore with, because we have a higher variability of um, implant dimension that at the beginning uh, we do not have it. Uh, we had also three minor complications, 2.2%, uh, screw breakage, screw loosening, and uh, symptomatic non-union. And this is something that is in contrast uh, with this, um, the result that is recently been published by this group. Uh, they reported that uh, one half, uh, one fourth of the patients, sorry, had a complication, so almost 25%, uh, 70.5 major complication, and in 12% they need to, to do a surgical revision. And they ended that complication were more likely as body weight increased. But looking uh, and reading this paper deeply, the thing that we noticed, and the authors reported that in the discussion, they said that the two experts uh, found several technical errors in the way the surgical techniques was performed in uh, large numbers of limbs. And also different surgeons with varying level of experience uh, performed the techniques in the cases uh, involved in this study. And that points uh, out the attention that probably there are some surgical key points that must be followed for successful clinical results. For example, uh, a proper surgical planning, the plate should be at the level of the radial head for achieving a correct uh, shifting of the mechanical axis. If the plate is too low, we cannot achieve any shifting, or so we will have a null effect of the technique. Another important thing is that the osteotomy, the position of the osteotomy, must be between all three and four of the plate. Another point is that the plate should be kept parallel to the sagittal plane. As we can see in this um, intraoperative image, we see that uh, the plate is positioned with the bone-holding bone holding forceps temporarily to look at, to look at the alignment. And the, in the radiographic evaluation, where we see OK, it means that the plate uh, was positioned properly. On the other hand, on the other X-ray, the plate is too oblique. That means that probably we will not achieve the same effect. Another important point is to have a proper caudal tilting. You can do that elevating a proximal segment uh, just a few millimeters with a periostal elevator. If uh, during fixation of the proximal segment, the proximal segment, it will not happen spontaneously. Sometimes it happens spontaneously, so you do not need to do any elevation. That's another important thing. The plate should be centered, pro centered properly, um, because as uh, in the example we, you can see on the right, uh, if the plate uh, is in contact with the radius, that can cause impingement, so that can cause also pain related to the impingement of the plate. And in that X-ray, there is another mistake. The plate is really, really high. There are um, another surgical key points. Uh, basing to the results uh, on the results of the paper I showed you before, we can consider to use the three millimeter plate for achieving a, a more uh, important deviation of the mechanical axis. And um, it's really important, as Ingo said, to consider also. Uh, a biologic approach to enhance fibrocartilage formation, in mainly in older dogs. And there are also a few key points for patient selection for successful results in the long term. We think that it's really important to explain to the owner the expectation of this technique, and the expectation are in relation to preoperative osteoarthritis, the age of the dog, and the owner should be aware that dogs will maintain their osteoarthritis. So relapses of lameness or lameness uh, uh, during morning uh, when the dog is more stiff uh, must be considered normal. The thing that we can expect is reduction of lameness, more active dog, and the reduced need of medication in the future. 
and others in other points that uh, we can consider is that we do not have to extend indications and not mainly due to the severity of the arthroscopic image of that dog but mainly to the reduction of range of motion for example in humans uh, when um, high tibial osteotomy is performed for the same condition of the of the knee of humans a good range of motion is required so we think that uh, that it's a good point to think about also for our clinical patients so in the end, uh, the expected outcome for us are influenced by proper planning and implant selection, precise surgical execution, proper case selection, and full compliance with the owners on post-operative care and future activity. And thank you for your attention, and I'm really happy to answer any question if you have any. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Um, and I apologize, the reason why uh, you couldn't see the slides originally was because apparently I made the transition too quick. So we'll, we'll take it a bit slower between this one and the next one. Um, and, and Reich, if you can hear us, could you please contact our team on the, on the Teams chat so we can get you set up for your next uh, call, please. Uh, what that means is that we do have probably time for a question or two for Sylvia right now as we bridge the gap and set up the next speaker. So do we have any, any questions from the room? Okay, let's, uh, I'd like to know how many of you here by show of hands are using Paul at the moment? Okay, so a few. And how many are using Q on a regular basis? One. Just, just one or two. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any remote questions for Sylvia specifically? Not just yet. We have one for Ingo. Okay, let's take let's take the one for Ingo until I get the nod that um, our next speaker is ready. Yeah, there is one question um, at, for Ingo, and somebody is asking how you treat biceps. Uh. Uh, honestly, we just make it conservative if it, if it is not so, uh, if synovitis is not uh, so much. If it is more, we are trying to get uh, the fibrous tissue, the synovitis uh, in the tender vaginitis by arthroscopy. We, uh, we burn them and then, no, we burn, uh, we do, uh, how do you call it? Uh, with arthroscopy, we, with the electrotome, we we melt them down, and then we after a while we give cortisone. Um, yes, cortisone. Most people don't like cortisone. I like it very much when you can, when you know how it works. As uh, you know, NSAIDs only uh, blocks PGF2, and but cortisone uh, also blocks interleukins and leukotrienes and prostaglandins. It's much more powerful. Uh, cutting the tendon, um, I'm very rare. If I must, yes, I do the Van Rysen technique. Uh, then I cut it, but I'm not happy to do that. Thank you. I, th I think there was maybe one more question for Ingo. Somebody is asking if they can already start ordering the new plates you presented. That's the only question, and I guess the answer is not yet. Uh -huh. So you're providing answers to the questions now as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now the the thing is, we uh, this Balu, which which uh, he was extreme external torsion, was nearly nine degree. So that opens a bit my mind. And the problem that was at the end of the last year, we started that only um, since November, December last year. But then the thing was that this dogs recover so fast that we go on and therefore I have 18 cases. And if we see all those presentations and you look at the results, 
and you look at Q results, and you look at poll results, and you look uh, SHO results, which represented in the AO, uh, they are nearly the, the same. In poll, for example, we get 50% uh, lame-free without NSAIDs over years, 40% uh, are recovering with uh, the people are satisfied, 10% are not so acceptable. Okay, the, the problem is, but, with the younger dogs, when we scoped them and we took out the coronet, we are leading them to a medial compartment. And the hope is that we get them before and they don't need a cue, they don't need a total elbow replacement, and perhaps stall can be the answer. I don't know. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm pleased to say that our next speaker is now apparently um, set up and, and ready to go. So. Uh, we, we now move to the UK, and uh, our next speaker is Reik Boats, uh, who is who's based in Medivet in Faversham in the UK. And uh, Reik is going to speak about uh, Hemi and Total Elbow Project, which is uh, a new project that we'll hear more about from a technical side from uh, Stephen Brissina this afternoon. So over to you, Reik. Thank you. Well, good morning. Yeah, it's a privilege to speak on this uh, very difficult of subject for all of us. And as you will know, um, elbow dysplasia has been the bane of orthopedic surgery, and uh, all of us have to deal with these cases. But until very recently, the tools in our arsenal to treat these uh, conditions has been rather sparse. You know, most of us until fairly recently could only offer a, a dynamic ulnar osteotomy with a vague hope that this may improve the lot for our patients. And Paul changed all that. And now uh, most of our cases with elbow dysplasia can successfully be treated, provided we do not expect something of Paul that it cannot um, deliver. When we see a case like this in a relatively young dog, perhaps with a kissing lesion, as you see on the left hand side, perhaps some osteophytes on that unconial process, as you see on the right hand side, you, know, you can be fairly certain that Paul will work well. But when you see a case like this with medial collapse due to a total erosion of that medial articular cartilage, severe subchondral, subchondral uh, sclerosis, the destruction of the coronoid process, you will know that the outcome for these patients uh, is not so good with pulse surgery. In fact, I think it is a total contraindication to try a pulse surgery on, on a case like this, especially when the patient is older, typically older than six to seven years old. Now, techniques like the Q has been developed and as our previous speaker has said, um, my experience is that it does offer a limited benefit, but over the long term, most of my cases at least did not have such good predictable outcomes. What was needed was a technique that was durable and you could repeatedly do with a reasonable chance that it will actually work. And of course, it has to be cost effective. In 2016, I partnered with Keon and uh, we started this hemi alba replacement uh, project. And I reported back on the progress of these patients in previous symposiums. In 2019, 19, I reported that the implants that we inserted in 2016 were reported very well, with the vast majority of patients performing very well after three years. And since 2019, we progressed with the development of this technique. And to date, I've performed you know, close to 50 of these cases with good follow-up uh, of the majority of these cases. All of the cases had medial compartment collapse with a lateral compartment in good condition. Most of these cases were at least nine years old. There were a few younger, but all of them had medial collapse. And the options for these cases were extremely limited. Now, bearing in mind that these cases selected were end-stage elbows, we had very promising results in the 
absolute vast majority of cases, most of them improved dramatically compared to their pre-surgical presentation, and we had very little complications. We also learned much about the limitations of this technique. The most important factor to consider in case selection is the range of elbow rotation. Where the range of rotation uh, is less than 20 degrees, none of the cases had any significant improvement compared to the preoperative level of pain. But that was also true for the, for the cases where we did the full medial replacement. And those with more than 20 degrees range remaining progressively did better the more the range of rotation remained prior to the surgery. Although the more severe cases re uh, retained a mechanical lameness, but they were mostly pain-free. And the following video will illustrate that. You will see this patient um, is quite lame in that left leg, but it doesn't show any pain whatsoever. And the application being that the earlier you address the, 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 the problem, the better the expected out outcome uh, will be. Our biggest problem was the length of time it took for these patients um, to recover. Now, initially, it took an average of eight to nine months before we could declare the surgery, the surgery a success. And with most of these patients already relatively old, uh, you know, to ask eight to nine months recovery was a lot to ask from both the pet and the owner. Now, when we started, we only had one size implant aimed at an average Labrador sized patient. But some of my patients were larger than others, and I noted that the larger patients recovered much quicker than the smaller size patient. And I operated a few German Shepherds, and they recovered very quickly. And I figured out that the reason was likely that the reaming of the implant was relatively less aggressive compared to the smaller patient. And in uh, the COVID lockdown of 2020, this observation led to a change in uh, technique for reaming the humerus. And we dropped the radius away from the reamer uh, so that we um, reamed far less of both the ulna and the, and the, and the radius. Uh, effectively, we only reamed the medial uh, humeral condyle and leaving the articular surface of the radius and the ulna intact. And the results were absolutely spectacular. And within six weeks, all of the patients that received the modified technique were walking significantly better than the patients uh, of comparative size prior to the change. And you will see on the left side is a, uh, is a dog of a, of a similar size than a dog on the right. The dog on the left showed um, lameness quite uh, quickly. Hopefully, we'll go back there. Let's see again. He doesn't want to go back now. But the dog on the left of the six weeks had significant lameness. The dog on the right side had just about no lameness of the six weeks. And objective, um, oh, there you go. The one on the left, quite lame of the six weeks. The one on the right, just about pain free. Objective uh, gait analysis of these patients consistently confirmed my subjective uh, observations. You will see there on the left hand side the blue and the red numbers that appraise the percentage. Um, you will see that the right leg of the six weeks is taking 31% of the weight on strike phase, um, bearing in mind that each leg would normally be 30%. Uh, with a total weight then taken by the front uh, uh, leg, 60% of the weight. The left leg uh, is significantly more painful than the right. And the right leg was, op was uh, obviously operated because it was a lot more pain uh, uh, in that leg before the operation going down to about 22%. The second part of this is that the step stride ratio, you'll see there on the right front, is consistently around 50%, roughly the same as on the left leg, meaning that 
in the swing phase of the gait, there's no significant pain, which basically means that the ulna is comfortable during the rotation when the elbow flexes and the leg is brought forwards. And this outcome has been repeated in all of the cases we've done since the change in technique. With now six cases uh, being completed since the modification of this technique, the signs are quite promising that we may have solved the problem of long recovery times. But of course, it, the, the, the speed of recovery and the final outcome is very much dependent on a pre-existing level of injury. Any changes to the, to the joint capsule and, uh, and the amount of arthritis in a joint is, is going to be there after the surgery as well. If a doc has got a limitation in the range of, of, of rotation before the surgery, that same uh, limitation in range of rotation is going to be uh, remain after the surgery. Your surgery doesn't change that at all. Now, also in the last uh, year or so, Kion has made available a wider range of implants to cater patients, which are roughly the size of a, of a Staffy, a Staffordshire Bull Terrier, right up to a, 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 a Rottweiler size. And the design has also changed over the couple of years. But the, but the principles all remain the same. It is a simple disc inserted in the medial condyle in the operation that takes about an hour and a quarter to, to complete. So the question is, where do we go from here? We have shown in the last couple of years that the implants are durable. They don't subside, they don't wear out, the patients tolerate them, they don't loosen. In fact, after, the, uh, after about six to eight weeks, you don't need any of those uh, plates you have, to, uh, uh, you have to stabilize that medial fat with. You can even remove the screw, the implantation, the, the, the bone integration into the implant is such that uh, it, it, uh, it is supported by the structure of the bone itself. We have also demonstrated that at the very least, the operation arrests this deterioration of the elbow and most cases improved far better than we dared hope. And uh, we also uh, um, had the surgical technique uh, developed to, the, to where it appears that we have dramatically shortened the recovery time. And what remains now is for my results to be repeated by many other surgeons. I do, also, I do also think that we can be a little bit more adventurous and do cases where uh, our experience show that the pole technique outcomes are less favorable, you know, where there is severe arthrosis, but not yet a medial compartment collapse. Or cases where the interosseous ligament is, is completely ossified, meaning the, your older patients. But I'm optimistic that we have now got a technique that brings hope for the quality of life of thousands of dogs with severe elbow pain. I do think also that um, there's a lot more development to take place, but I'm very hopeful for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for a, a very interesting and, um, and hopeful uh, story there and, and, and report. Um, the the next 15 minutes now or so uh, before our keynote speaker are designated for discussion. So hopefully we've still got our three speakers online and, uh, and Ingo is still in the room. If you'd like to join us up on stage, then you're more than welcome to. Um, if you have a question, uh, either in the room or on the Q&A, please state who your question is for, which one of our four speakers. Uh, just, to, just to remind you, we kicked off with, uh, with Ingo with a view, uh, an overall view of elbow dysplasia. And then we moved on to Peter's talk on, on the Q procedure. And then Sylvia gave us a, a rundown of, of Paul. And then, as we saw, Reich just spoke to us about the, uh, the Hemi Elbow project. So. Uh, Firstly, I, I'm pleased to see that we are getting some questions from uh, from our internet audience, but I'll take one from the room if there's a burning question in the room to start with. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's start off with, I'm assuming 
This is for Peter, the top one, right, Domenica? Yeah, so for Peter, the question is, what do you think about uh, micro motions in the implant? Is there any risk of that? Have you seen that? Um, I, I, would, so I would think that this is related to loosening uh, in terms of that they are not stable, integrated in the bone. So this is how I would understand the question. Uh, and I can tell that the only um, uh, knowledge that we have about loosening is uh, in the presence of septic arthritis. So we had uh, cases, uh, two cases over the years, uh, which had septic arthritis in the operated joints. And uh, in both of those limbs or joints, we had loosening of the ulnar component. Uh, we never saw loosening of the humeral component. And uh, personally, I'm not aware of any other report um, mentioned uh, loosening of the humeral implant. So if ever um, we might face a challenge in terms of stability of the ulnar implant, but as far as I know, uh, only um, in respect to septic loosening, which is, I mean, just a matter of fact with any type of implant, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a mechanical issue in getting loosening. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the next question relates to Paul, so uh, for, for Sylvia. Um, and the question is, when post-op do you expect to see full recovery with the Paul procedure? Yes, uh, uh, the thing depends uh, if we are using the new implants or the old implants. With the new generation of implants, we expect a quicker recovery. And the thing that we tell to the owner and usually uh, we see the end results of the technique uh, between the four to six months post-job. In fact, that's the way, the time in which we decide to treat the other elbow if necessary. I mean, the bone healing is achieved quicker, but the clinical results, we expect to judge them not before four months post-job. Okay, thank you. Uh, any. I'll hand back to the room. We have a question for, from the room here. Okay, thank you. I have a question for uh, for Peter. Uh, hi, Peter. It's Luca. Um, if you have uh, in data on the longer term results with the, with the queue concerning wear of the implants or subsidence of the implants, maybe after three, four, or five years after after surgery. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, we have no. Um, well-controlled study on this. Uh, we have a few reports on uh, our cases and I have seen pictures of cases of other surgeons, uh, the day of euthanasia of those dogs. Um, and uh, it, it is uh, correct that at least in a certain number of dogs, we do not know about how big this number is. Uh, there seems to be wear in that uh, form that the humeral implant is grinding uh, into the humeral, uh, into the ulna uh, bone uh, and implant, a little bit similar to what I showed in, in the picture where we see this uh, grinding line. And um, this is something we will have to look into uh, more in detail, whether this is a kind of a mechanical conflict. So it could be that in those cases, uh, implantation of the humeral implant was suboptimal in terms of that it produces a step uh, so that the step is kind of acting uh, like, uh, I mean, a really mechanical conflict during flexion and uh, extension. Um, this could be corrected by better surgical technique, jigs or whatever. Um, but of course, it could be that at least in some of those cases, this mechanical effect is attributed to the fact that all the forces are concentrated on this little small implant producing a relatively small white bearing area. And so per se, in some cases, uh, this might be just a consequence of mechanical overload. Uh, we don't know which one is the correct answer and how many of those treated dogs really have that problem. But it's, it's a potential uh, scenario that we already saw in very few selected cases. Thank you very much. Uh, Luca doesn't have the microphone anymore, but he's nodding his head. So I, I think that was a good answer. Um, we, uh, we have a, a, an elbow question now regarding uh, Biometrics' tape system. Uh, 
Reich, do you have any experience with the with the Tate system, um, and how would you compare it to this uh, the new Keon product that that you spoke about? Okay, um, I have got experience with uh, with the Tate system, but not the newest uh, uh, techniques. My techniques is a little bit dated. Um, uh, the reason being that uh, the failure rate was so high that I could not justify going on with this. But you can't compare the Hemi replacement to a full replacement. Um, I think um, bearing in mind what we achieved and the speed of recovery of my of my patients since our technique change, I think we are effectively doing a resurfacing of the medial um, uh, 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 condal, uh, similar to what the Q is trying to do. I think we're just doing it better in the sense that the whole articular surface is is affected rather than one spot. Plus, uh, uh, one of the reasons why I changed from the Q to the to the to the Hemi was the fact that I had sub the the subsidence of, of 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 my implants, and which was one of the reasons why we scrutinized these cases uh, over the years. Point being that uh, the hemi replacement is only replacing the medial uh, 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 condylar surface, not the whole elbow. Um, it's two different things altogether. Excellent, thank you very much. And, and a follow-up question about the uh, the hemi, um, which may be for Steve Brasina. Uh, what's the expected timeline for the hemi elbow to be commercially available? Oh, Guy's going to take that one. Nope, he's passing the baton. <laughs> Good, so we have the Hemi Elbow at three clinical sites right now. We're expanding to three more sites in the next months that are going to begin using it. But we don't expect to have a general release for probably another half year or so. And even at that point, it's going to be you know, restricted to people that do THR. So somebody that's experienced in doing joint replacement type surgeries. It is complicated uh, to do in the beginning, but um, you know, there, we are looking to add sites, so if people are interested in it and if they're qualified for it, we'd, be, we'd like to talk with them. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, if you're online or you're in the room and you, you're experienced with total hip replacement and you're interested in looking into this and becoming a, a development site, then please contact uh, Stephen Brasina. So, okay, um, back to Paul again. Um, Sylvia, do you have some impressions about carpal hypoextension after Paul surgery? Actually, we do not have that type of complication. Never happened. Okay. I followed every cases because I'm working there since 12 years. So before we started doing poll, and to be honest, I remember every case because I did the scope of these cases. And uh, to be honest, I do not remember any case with this type of complication. Great, thank you very much. Can I just uh, say something there on that uh, topic? Sure. Um, it's quite a number of our cases that uh, received a hemi replacement has been cases or had been cases that had failed pole surgeries. Um, and the reason why um, I think this is important people doing the pole and people that are thinking of doing the hemi is that there are limitations to both. And uh, there's a huge overlap between which cases you would do Paul and which cases I think is the place for the Hemi. My point being that the more severe cases of Paul should be Hemis. Um, and the reason why Paul sometimes get a bad name is because people are asking too much of, a, of, an, of an operation which is not able to achieve. You have to think about the, 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 the biomechanics behind the operations, not just do the operation. Think of what you want to achieve. And Paul is a great surgery with great outcomes if you choose the right patient. And the same applies to the hemi. Yeah, thank you for those additional comments. And I guess maybe the reason why Sylvia hasn't seen any of these complications is because of her good case selection. No, let's say, can I ask one? Can I add one thing? Sure. The, the thing that for us is really important, and we started at the beginning with not such a strict case selection, 
is to really look at the range of motion of this dog, because probably at the beginning we do not see any carpal extension, but we probably we do not have the good results because we extend in the indication. I totally agree with that. And probably we have to think about treating cases, uh, not only looking at the arthroscopic image, so the severity of joint compartment disease, but also at the uh, possibility of this elbow to have a quite normal or not so reduced range of motion for achieving the correct results of Paul. I would agree there that um, the cases we, I would say we are total failure of the HEMI, both of, sorry, both the full and the HEMI, was uh, or, or, or work cases where the range of motion has been reduced. Um, I think that is the key factor in both Paul as well as Amy. Great, thank you both. I, I asked something to my colleagues. Yes, please. Um, as far as I understand, if you have quite a lot of restriction in range of motion, those techniques might not have the best outcome. This is what I understood from your comments. That's so now I'm asking, what is the what is the mode of action? So if it's pain relieving, it should relieve at least a good portion of pain, even if there's only 30 degree of motion in this uh, joint. So for me, it's hard to to believe that this that, that the principal mode of action should work in a highly mobile joint, but is not working in a immobile joint, or at least a significantly reduced joint. So uh, I have a hard time to understand this. So either we treat pain and we are successful, but they are still pay a lame because of mechanical lameness, which I personally, I doubt 100%. Um, or we are not really treating pain, and then we are not treating in the highly mobile and neither in the immobile ones. So I, I have a problem there. Okay. Um, I, I think the answer is um, that the that the cause of pain is not uh, coming only from the joint surfaces. I do think that the, there are other sources of pain. For example, a joint capsule becoming calcified has to be a source of pain, and you cannot correct that with either the pole or the um, or the hemi, and, and, and for that matter, you can't correct it either with a, with a, with a full replacement. The point is, there are other sources of pain. It's not a very simplistic thing. As far as the, as the, as the mechanical lameness, those things have been checked also with a local uh, with a joint infusion with um, with uh, uh, local anesthetics, which I will not do anymore after the previous uh, symposium. I think Anil actually told us that about the destruction of the cartilage. But that has been checked in the past on that specific white dog you saw earlier, and uh, the pain of this patient has not changed. Uh, now, it may be a factor that the pain was coming from the joint capsule, not from the joint articular surfaces. The point is that um, I think there's more, more at play than just uh, pain from articular surfaces. The whole joint and the joint capsule itself uh, plays a part. Okay, thank you. And. Uh Mm -hmm. Our is just a thought. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that we need a complete range of motion and not such a reduced range of motion, but thinking of fibrotic joint capsule and uh, massive osteophyte formation, I'm, I'm thinking, we are thinking if the pole is able to induce the shifting of the mechanical uh, mechanical axis due to reduce of um, due to the fibrotic joint capsule i'm not talking about mechanical lameness i think that the poor results that we can have in such cases is, is that because the pull technique probably is not effective but i'm not saying that we need to treat uh, uh, mild cases for achieving good, good results and i think i'm saying that we need probably a more strict case selection Okay. Excellent. Thank you all um, for, for that, for those answers. We have another question to the entire panel. Um, and the question is, in the last 10 years of developing products to treat elbow dysplasia, what were the biggest mistakes and what were the biggest learnings? So uh, maybe we'll start with, uh, with Ingo in the room. Yes. Um, I think what... Uh, since the study of uh, Danielson, we know that it's happening in the stance phase. The problem is when the elbow is pressed together, the humerus to the, uh, to the ulnar notch and to the radius, then every study we did with uh, a thrust 
arthroscopy, step finding, CTs, uh, CTs for proving steps as we have supination and pronation, and of those studies can't be right. That is one thing. Uh, as if you stick something in inside, you can't uh, judge that anymore. And also, um, the pathophysiology, I think, is not understand right now very good. And if we understand the pathophysiology, perhaps we are coming to a point that we avoid this media compartment. That is, that should be the aim, also for breeding or that's what I can say. So we need to treat the underlying cause rather than the symptoms. Yeah. Would anyone else like to, uh, to take that question about uh, the last 10 years of biggest mistakes and biggest learnings? Uh, I might start. Um, I see the evolution of what we know and what we do in all those bad elbows very positive. 10 years ago, we just had Rimadu. And that's, that was our answer to those uh, bad elbows. And now we have discussion which technique might be better in which circumstance. And we, we are talking about case selection and probably none of us knows the truth, but at least we have good proposals and we have good outcome in at least a good number of cases. Yeah, We are not solving the problem, but uh, we, can, we can do something good for those dogs. Um, so this is this, this that's the positive aspect of uh, what we achieved in the last 10 years and we are not at the end point i'm sure that in another 10 years we might have uh, other techniques uh, and probably improved techniques i would totally agree with uh, ingo that in terms of understanding and really influencing a healing healing the the disease i mean a prosthesis is not healing it's a substitute it's not healing and so uh, to to understand it to heal it to prevent it uh, we are as yeah we have no idea better than 10 years ago so we we had a lot of ideas we 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 have found a lot of things but we can't translate them to a clinical uh, improvement and unless we understand it, we can diagnose it early and we might influence the disease process, we will always have those bad elbows. So, um, yeah, so that's the downside. I'm very frustrated uh, also about my research about the last 10 years. Um, it has not improved that aspect of the disease, but at least we have now a good number of tools to deal with those bad elbows. Thank you. Yeah, so the we're not there yet, but the process of ed innovation, education, and research is uh, is working. Yes. Would uh, would uh, either of you like to chip into that, um, Sylvia or Reich? Mm, the, the only thing uh, I think it's really important to to look at the elbow elbow conditions like a really huge scenario of possibilities. Just talking about media compartment disease, we are facing a lot of different scenarios in different breeds. And the thing that I see more commonly is that, um, for example, a Rottweiler has a different type of uh, elbow disease uh, than, a, uh, than a Labrador Retriever or a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. So I think we have to have an open mind and treat every case in a different way. You can ask me which way, we do not know yet, but really we need to be more strict, not only for selection of techniques, but also for types of uh, uh, diagnostics conditions. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not treating an elbow with the same prognosis of a Labrador than of a Rottweiler. They have a different type of uh, follow-ups and different type of results. So I think we have to open our cases and look at different um, at um, different type of conditions also for giving a more precise prognosis to the owners from my as from my uh, perspective biggest mistakes that i've made which i've seen repeated by my colleagues um, would be to expect too much um, on cases which you should not do so know when to stop <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, we just have time for one more question. I think um, if I could have the question back up here. No. Okay. 
No, apparently not. Uh, any any more questions from the room? Yes, we have we have a question in the front here. Uh, it's a it's a general question. Uh, do you ever see any coexisting problems with the flexor at the medial epicondyle? Because we encounter a lot of inflammation processes uh, together with elbow problems, um, inflammation, uh, chronic inflammation, uh, and how do you address them? Sorry, I didn't get. I didn't get it. Please. Maybe, maybe you can translate, or, or you I didn't. didn't get it either. Oh, you couldn't hear it. Okay. Um, in my clinic, we see I think about 30% of flexor. Uh, inflammation on the medial epicondyle, and I think it's the the the, uh, the digital flexor, and we see inflammation or chronic inflammation or uh, bone formation, and I think it has a painful condition. Um, and in what extent do you see them? Do you treat them? Yes. But I could give you the question back. <laughs> we see them, and sometimes uh, the uh, digital flexors sometimes I are uh, rubbed off, and then we we are trying to reinsert them, but the um, um, the results are not so not so fine. And if I see them, I'm I'm trying to treat them more conservatively. But the question is, why are doing that? We see that very regular. And mostly if you treat elbow and uh, you are sagittalizing the, the limb, uh, they are recovering, they, you still see them, see them, but they are not so painful. But if anyone has an, an answer, Klaus, you have an answer? No, no? okay, <laughs> not either. <laughs> I think the, the, the principle we have to remember that these things are most commonly just a complication of a, of a painful elbow. If the patient is changing, changing the gait, it's going to lead to consequences, whether it is the flexor tendon or it's a bicep ten, uh, uh, tendonitis or one of those things. It's like, it's like tennis elbows. You use your elbow in a different way, you're going to have pain. You use it for long enough, you're going to have some sort of uh, a, a tendon flaring up. Uh, Although most of them will respond just by treating the elbow, uh, they can become a problem all in its own right. And for that, I think, Ingel, you've got much better information. I personally treat those with, uh, with a stem cell treatment. Um, and uh, my success rates are quite high. But I think, Ingel, you've got much better information that I would have. But I, I, I do want to say this is a changing gait that leads to these consequences. Okay, thank you. I'm going to have to draw that discussion to a close. That was, that was great. That's really what we wanted to st sort of stimulate in the way of, dis of uh, discussion. So thank you, Ingo. Thank you for all our, to all our remote speakers. Please give them all a round of applause.